Hello, my friend, and welcome to Security and Secure, hosted by me, Johnny Seifert. This is a celebrity mental health podcast where I say it's okay to not be okay. And if you have the same mantra as me, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Acast, Apple Music, Spotify, click that subscribe button, click the notification button, leave a five-star rating and a review. And let's keep spreading the word, it's okay to not be okay. Now, let me tell you about my guest today. My guest today was seen as an elusive on the traitors this year, but the story of looking at his identity started age 21, 24 years ago when he entered a new chapter in his life after a car crash that he was involved in. So to tell his mental health journey and how that shaped him over the years, I'm delighted to welcome to Skudinska, the traitor himself and an NLP practitioner, it's Andrew Jenkins. 1999 is the year and there's a car crash. That's where this part of the story begins. Talk to me yeah. about that day and what you remember about that car crash. To be honest, I don't remember much about the car crash because obviously as soon as I, the car flipped onto the side, I was thrown out of the, right, I was at the driver's window, uh, the side window, and my head hit the floor. And I was unconscious, I assume. So I don't really remember. That's what I mean, for, for the other people in the car, there was five of us in the car in total. There was my partner at the time in the passenger seat. There was my best friend and his partner in the back. There was a girl on her own in the back. So there was five of us in the car. So for them, I think it was probably worse for them. They remember everything. They didn't have a scratch in any of them. So they probably remember. Psychologically, it was a lot worse for them than it was for myself because I can't remember it. Obviously, physically, I was obviously hurt badly. For them, it was a lot worse. So I don't really remember a great deal apart from when I woke up four weeks later or a few weeks later. And what did they say the crash was caused by? So I hit, I clipped the curb and the car flipped onto the side. And then obviously I was, I was out the driver's window. I was dragged along the floor for a couple of hundred yards then. And the other four, they were stay out, still in the car afterwards? Not a, luckily, they didn't have a scratch because my, my partner, when the car stopped sliding, she was hanging above me with her. She had a seatbelt on, luckily. She was hanging above me. Uh, the people in the back, I had a 316 BMW then back then. It was my first car. So the back was quite small. So they were quite compact in the back. So they didn't really move around at all. So they were all, and the only scratches they had is when the fire brigade would break in the glass to get them out of the car. Obviously, to get them all out of the car, but apart from that, they had no injuries at all. And I hope this is okay to ask Andrew. Why yeah. did you hit that curb? Or were you going at a speed? What what caused the accident to actually happen? I can't really remember. I can't remember a great deal about it. To be honest, I say there was a grass, there was a bank, a grass verge running alongside, and the curb was underneath the grass. So I couldn't see the grass. I couldn't see the curb underneath the grass really. So uh, yeah, I hit the curb and. Yeah, I flipped, it. I flipped the car then. That's your journey. We're talking about your journey over the past 24 years. You had four people as passengers. Before we get to your journey, how do you now look back at their journey and what they've been through? Because as you said, they don't have any scars and, and any damage to them. You are the one who took it all. But as the driver as well, you took it all. So when you think about the four people in the car and the way you look at them now, what's that relationship like? Do they blame you? Do you have more guilt that you've had to carry through even though you're now better? What's your mental relation to them? It's only been the last say, couple of years I've started opening up and talking about things. I haven't really spoken, obviously, to anybody. It's like, not the elephant in the room, a brush under the carpet. The girl in the back, the two girls in the back, really, I haven't really spoken. I haven't seen them for many, many years. My ex-partner, I've just got a son with her, so... Um, I, I've spoken to her for many, many for years. I've been speaking to her. We've never actually had the conversation about the accident. We never actually sat and talked about how she felt about the accident. And obviously I should do, I suppose, talking about mental health and being an advocate of mental health. I've never actually sat and talked to her. I only spoke to the boy in the, car, the back of the car about the accident. I think it was last year. I, I was sat and talking to him for hours. We had a really good open conversation and he told me things that I didn't even know happened. Obviously, why he did it on that night, the night of the accident, how he's felt, uh, how he dealt with it, the aftermath. He never had any counselling or he never... He never saw any professional help or anything. Just if he was feeling a bit down, he'd, he'd just get drunk or forget about it, I suppose. But um, so we've never, it's a strange one. We've never had a really, nobody's ever had the conversation about it, I suppose, apart from me and the boy in the back. So when it now comes out and you've done the traitors and you've said that you've been in the class and obviously you're doing podcasts and interviews and you're being spoken to about it, does it not make you want to reach out to two ladies in question and say, well, look, I suppose this is part of your journey as well. This is in the public. Obviously, their names aren't there. It's anonymous. We're not going to ask for their names. But we actually need to have that conversation now. And the, the idea of everything happens for a reason. Like I've gone on TV. And we'll, we, you know, we're going to go back to this whole journey. But I've gone on TV. Yeah. Everything happens for a reason. That's now why this needs to be spoken about. And that there isn't an elephant in the room. Because until you speak about that elephant in the room, as you put it, yeah. how are you supposed to fully move on without the acceptance of their of their accepting an apology or their acceptance of just knowing, look, it's okay, mate. It's okay. It's 24 years ago. We've moved on and it's now time for you to move on so that you don't have to keep getting asked about this every single time you speak to someone about it. 100% I agree with you totally. And that it's a conversation I've been to have for the last 
say I only spoke to my family about the accident for the first time about seven, eight months ago. So I only spoke to my mother and father, my brothers, my three brothers, and my son about the accident about eight, nine months ago, last year. So yeah, it's the commerce conversations that's been happening the last couple of months. Really, that was the last few months have been a bit crazy. So yeah, I, I do want to speak to my son's mother, for example, my partner at the time, because I I always care about her, and respect her, because she was obviously told at seventy, she was seventeen years of age at the time, and she was told when I was in my coma that she she was that my mother sat down, her mother sat down, the doctor sat down and said, look. If you're going to leave, the likelihood is you're going to be, uh, he's not going to be able to recognize anyone, walk, talk ever again. So if you're going to leave him, now is the best time to do it. And in all fairness, I'll always respect this woman. And I'll, uh, son of my oh, mother and my son, even, I'll always respect her. But she said, no, I'll stick by him. So she stuck by me through all of that, being told, you know, to expect the worst. And for like a 17 year old, younger 17 year old girl or anybody at that age, I think a lot of people probably would have run a mile, I suppose. But she knows I'm going to stick by him through it. So I'll, she'll always be a, a, in. A, a special person to me, I suppose. It, it just, I'll always respect her for that, for sticking by me. So it's a conversation I need to have with her, just sit down and talk to her. But I think it'll be quite tricky. It's going to be a difficult conversation, emotional conversation, I imagine, but it's one I really want to have. And when it came to the traitors and you were cast for it, and you thought, okay, I'm, I've done your application form, I'm now through to that round, I'm through to the next round, and I'm about to go on to that show, and then I'm filming. And obviously... And, and I'm not talking about revealing any secrets, but obviously it's filmed in advance. It's not a live show. We know that. That's, you know, very yeah. clear. It's not a live show yeah, because yeah. the camera works in- incredible on it and that takes time to edit it all together. But in that yeah. time that it was being filmed and you were there being filmed and then the time when the show, you'd finished filming it and then when it came out, mentally, what did that do to you when you were thinking, oh, hold on a minute, this is going to come up and also she's now going to see me on TV and if, you know, it's the biggest show on TV for the month of January, she's going to be reminded of everything that's gone on. Did that trigger you in any way? Or have you come to peace with that side of, I'm okay now, I'm okay, they may not be, but I am. Because that's the first step of that grief journey yeah. I suppose, that you've had to go on. Like I said, I was on the grief cycle, as you know, the grief cycle, but it's only been the last couple of years I've been in acceptance. I don't think I'm, I don't know if I'm 100% there now, but I'm obviously much better now than I was one year ago, six years ago, five years ago, whatever. So I'm, you know, it's an ongoing journey all the time. And you know, I thought I had PTSD to start off. But then I saw a counsellor and she said, no, you're grieving. I said, well, grieving. this is a couple of years ago. I said, well, grieving. I said, that's when somebody dies. And she goes, on the night of the accident, you did die. Because all I've heard off you today is, I used to do this. I used to do this. You're grieving for your whole life. So I've only really been understood I was, on, I was grieving for 20 odd years. Not a long, not a long ago, really. So... Yeah, it's one of those things. I like, she's married my my ex partner. We don't. My son's twenty two now, so we used to have a lot of contact when he was growing up. But for the last couple of years, we don't really, we haven't spoken to each other for a few years, to be honest. With you. There's no need. Because my son's old enough now. So when he was in school, it was all amicable. We had an amicable relationship, and you know we go to my parents' evening together. We go to school sports day together. You know Christmas concerts together. So we only we were only talking. I suppose for. Because of my son, because of my son, but now he's older, he's 22. There's no need for us to speak. I need to contact her and speak to her and sit down and have a conversation. But oh, she's married now with her husband, so I don't know how you would feel about it. But you know, it's something I'm gonna have to do. It's, it's part of my ongoing journey, it's part of my healing, I think, to have that conversation and see how she felt and how she's feeling. Let's go back to the beginning of that grief journey. You wake up in a coma after four weeks, you're starting yeah. to work out who you are now. Why do you think you were saved? What was the thing about the universe, about God, about your parents that saved you and meant that you didn't die that night? My family background is I got an amazing family. I got three brothers. I was a mother and father, old traditional family, good values, good morals. We we're just all quite resilient and quite strong people. Four boys in the house, rugby boys. We all keep fit. We're all quite very fit. We do a lot of training on our own. We also play rugby. So I think that that helped me a lot to get during the acts. I was quite a big guy at the time. I'm quite big now, but at the time I was very, very fit. I wanted to play rugby, professional rugby. I lived and breathed rugby from five years of age to 21. Rugby was my life, really. And uh, so that helped me. I think that helped me a lot. And a lot of this, I think, is down to resilience, which I had growing up with three brothers. And obviously, being strong, strong mentally and physically. That, and being positive and determined, I think that's what helped me. And obviously, part of it is luck as well. But I, I truly believe a lot of this mental the self-belief and uh, you know determination not wanting to give up well this grief journey isn't as you've said just about you this is a grief about the rugby and what you wanted to be as a player and how fit and resilient you are when it came to that as a sport so how did you start chapter two of your life without the rugby and without the old Andrew who you knew and loved and had that kind of not that you ever fully know yourself but at age 21, you knew yourself to an extent that you almost had to go like snakes ladders all the way back again 
and learn about why I'm a cool guy, what the best traits about me are. Such a difficult journey. And I struggled for 20 years with it, to be honest, because I lost my identity as a rugby player. And the, the physical injury I had were horrendous. They were awful. I had to learn to walk. They told me I'd never walk ever again. Um, so I learned to walk. So the physical side of it was, that was okay. That was tough. But the, the hardest thing for me was the mental side of it. Um, so for, for years, I struggled. And the biggest, one of the biggest, it sounds crazy when I say it now, but I lost my identity as a rugby player. The only way I thought of making my dad proud was playing rugby. Uh, you know, we're playing, you know, winning rugby matches, being the best player, man of the match. And I, I, I believe I had the ability to represent my country. And that's what I dreamed of, representing, running out in, in national stadium, singing the anthem. And I dreamed of that. I'm not saying I would ever have done it. I don't know. It's all if some buts and maybes. I don't know. But I believe I could have. So that got taken off me overnight. So I, then I thought my dad perhaps didn't love me anymore. I couldn't make him proud anymore. I like my three brothers were still playing rugby. They were playing rugby at a good standard as well. So they, all of us were still playing rugby. So I'd go to my parents' house on a Sunday, for example, when all the family used to meet in my mother and father's house. She used to put on a big family tea. And my three brothers were still playing rugby. So they sit in my mother and father's house. So what would happen is all the men would end up in one room with my dad, watching Scrum Five on the telly normally on a Sunday. And all the women and wives and girlfriends and children end up in the other room. My mum, all my brothers are still sitting there talking. I played rugby yesterday. I scored a try. We've done this. And I'm sat there thinking, what can I talk about? I got nothing to contribute to the conversation. So I didn't think that my, my brothers were better than me. And so this built up my head over the years. And then I just went quiet. I'd sit in my mother and father's house and they'd all be talking. And I'd be sat there in silence pretty much. And they just, and they say to me, oh, you changed. And yeah, you changed. You're different. And so they didn't actually understand me why. And it's only been the last couple of years after a lot of research and studying and self-evaluation. I understood why this conversation last year, my mother and father, and for the first time in 24 years, I sat down and, when I first had the conversation, I sat them down and said, look, I want to talk to you because I want to start talking about mental health and helping people. And they say, it's funny, they're, old, they're really old school. Oh, what do I want to talk about that for? What do I want to talk about the accident for? You know, you're a different boy, you know, you changed. I said, but, yeah, but you asked me why I changed. Well, no, why do you just went quiet and moody? I said, well, why? I don't know. I said, because I thought you didn't love me anymore. I thought I, I couldn't make you proud anymore. I didn't think my brothers were better than me. And I thought it was so silly. Of course, of course we love you. I said, I know you do. But at the time, I didn't think that. So, you know, it's funny when you speak to anybody else who knows me outside of the house, they say I'm always life life and soul of the party, bubbly and loud. When I come here, I, I'm quiet. I go in my shell. Then when I come into my mother's house, I go into my shell. So it, it went on for so long. And then it's only been like to the last year. I started talking to my family about the accident. They understand me better now. How judged did you feel when you were like that? And in those initial first years, how judged did you feel? Did you feel that you were a burden to them? That almost it would have been better... Had you not survived? Had it been better that your partner could have left you? Could it have been better that your parents had this Andrew who was a rugby player who was 21 years old, who had everything going for him, and it was such a sad loss versus the Andrew they represented to now? 100%, yeah. I felt I caused so much stress and grief to my mother and father. I, must have pulled it. I, I, I can't imagine to think what they felt, that what they were going through, being told, you know, the knock on the front door from the police that night to say, you have to come with us now. Your son's been involved in a road traffic accident. And they said, you know, can we, can we get dressed in it? And they said, you haven't got time to get... They weren't, they weren't naked, but they were in their, their bedwear, their nightwear, I suppose. They said, we'll get changed now. Uh, they said, we haven't got time. We need, to, we need to come now. It's critical. So I just can't imagine what that, must have, what that must be like for somebody being told your son or your daughter, your child is being... Is, is critical. So I felt I was a burden. And sometimes I, I, have some, I never once thought about taking my own life, but I had some very dark times. And I thought I would be better off if I died in my accident. I'm just a burden to people. I'm a burden to my family. You know, I, I'm ashamed of... You know, Ashamed, they were ashamed of me. I, they weren't proud of me anymore. And I, there's times I thought I was crying, lying in my bedroom, looking up at the ceiling, crying. You know, wish I wasn't here anymore, and all this sort of thing. And uh, yeah, it was. I had some very dark days for many, many years. I lost all my confidence, my self belief. I hated what I saw in the mirror. I, I speak to my mother now. She she gets upset when she said I I used to say some awful things to myself. I'm a freak. I'm ugly. Nobody will ever want to be with me. If somebody comes to my mother and father's house, I'd run upstairs in the bedroom because they want nobody to see me. And it, it break, used to break my mother's heart to hear her son saying things like that about her, about himself. I went through some bad times, but then, you know, it went on for so long, so long telling myself awful things every day. And I started to believe that after a while then. You normalise those behaviours because you think it's, uh, I, that is my coping mechanism. What else can I do? How many times yeah. in the 24 years did they say they love you? I know, no, I can't remember. Well, it's not, I don't think so. No. And we all know we love each other. I've got a close family. If I needed any of my brothers, they'd be there for me now. But I, we never, I, my family don't show any emotions or feelings towards each other. They don't, I've never seen my family display any feelings, hug each other, say they love each other. We know we do, but we don't, we don't, don't display it. We don't show it. I've never seen my family show any 
I've never seen any of them cry. I've never seen any of them hug my mother. I've never seen, I've never seen any of them show any of them affections. I've seen growing up, I suppose, we're from the family, like an old school family, I suppose, where if you saw any feelings or emotions, that's classed as a sign of weakness. Like we're a big, strong, hard men, rugby boys. We can't show any feelings. You're not a real man. I was never told that. Like, my parents never said anything bad to me ever. They never said anything negative towards me, but they also never said anything good to me either. They never said anything nasty to me, but they never said anything good either. So, you know, it was just these things. That's the thing. I just brought up thinking that was the way I had to act. If I tell you something, my friend, um, mm. it's taken 24 years, but you did the traitors. Consequently, maybe around that, when it comes to the way the universe works, you've sat down with your parents and had that first conversation about mental health. And the Jenkins family, because of you, because of what you've done for future generations, for the your brothers, for the grandkids, the kids that come after, and all the Jenkins generations, when you're a great, 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 great grandfather, they're going to be talking about mental health. And they're going to be saying, I love you. And that's all because of what you've done. And it took that accident. And it took a show like The Traitors 24 years later for that to start. And that's the legacy, my friend, that you're going to have for that. That 21-year-old Andrew who was seeking guidance from the world. Pre-accident, everything was going well. You're focusing on the rugby. You had your boys you were bantering with. What do you wish you had told that 21-year-old self now with the lessons that you've now learned about yourself? Your self-worth is not determined by the things you achieve in life. Your self-worth is your own, your morals, your, your, your ethics. That Your self-worth is, you know, don't. Don't, it's not determined by how big your house is, how many rugby matches you win, you know what what car you drive, and all. It's all about yourself. You don't let your, don't beat yourself up. And I think these days, youngsters especially, there's so much pressure put on people with social media these days to look a certain way. When I was growing up, I didn't know anybody who had a Lamborghini. I didn't know anybody who had a swimming pool in their house. Now, if I look at social media, I think everybody's got that. Everybody's got a six pack. Everybody's got a, a mansion with a Lamborghini parked outside. And I think kids are looking at this now. I'm not one of these people like old people thinking. Or in the olden days was better. It's, it's social media is good, but I think parents need to speak to their children and say, look, go on it, look at it, but don't believe it. It's all it's all crap. And you know, take it with a pinch of salt, look at it. You know, we don't believe it all. Do you mean it's all it's all a lot of it's made up to be honest? You just to sell more stories, get more likes and everything. Because I think a lot of people, you know, if unless you've got these things in life, unless you've got a you know top of the range car, a big house, you think you're a failure in life, unless you've got a six pack, unless you've got a women, for example, got a, a big lips or a certain cup size you think you, you're failing in life you know but that, that's not, it's not the case and there's so much pressure put on people these days to look a certain way it's hot it's hot mental health is is, is, a, is a massive problem at the moment but you know that's i think my self-worth is not determined by me playing rugby i'm a, i'm me as a person I, I, i'm a good person i'm a good human being and no matter what i did if i played rugby or didn't play rugby and it, sorry the big thing for me after i spoke to my mother and father on the friday night i spoke to my son on a saturday morning I spoke to my brother in the Saturday afternoon, my other brother on a Sunday, and my other brother on a Monday. It was such an emotional, I turned a corner in our relationship with all my family because I built this conversation up in my head for 20 odd years. But when I had the conversation, it was fine. They wanted to ask me questions, but they didn't want to trigger anything. I wanted to tell them things, but I, I couldn't. So when I actually sat them down, like my son, for example, he was 22 years of age. I sat my son down in a coffee shop in Cardiff and I said to him, you know, you're 22 years of age. I got to have a conversation with what dad wants to do now, talking to people, helping people. You're going to see things on social media. But I want, I said, what do you know about my accident? He said, nothing. He said, growing up all my life, I wonder where your scars were, but I didn't want to ask you. He said, I asked my mother a few times, but she said, I'll tell you when you're older. You're too young. I'll tell you when you're older. So we had a conversation about everything. We talked, we had a four hour chat in a coffee shop and we talked about everything, drugs, girls, drink, everything. We had a, such an open conversation. So, and at the end of the conversation, I'm hoping I like not turned the corner. I said to my son, I hugged him for the first time ever in my life. I hugged my son and I told him I loved him. <clears throat> Sorry. So I told him I loved him and I hugged him. And that was the first time in 22 years I had done that. And I said to him, I'm proud of you. Sorry, I'm going to God. Sorry, God. I said to him, no matter what you do in life, I don't care. I don't care what you, if you play rugby, I don't care how big your house is, what car you got. I couldn't give, I don't care. As long as you're a good person. As long as you're nice and polite and you're a good person with good morals and good values, that means more to me than everything. And then people come up to me in the street and who know me, I'm his dad. They say, they say, oh, Morgan's such a polite kid. He's a lovely boy. And that means more to me than anything. Like, I, he plays rugby. And I watch him play rugby. He's a good rugby player. But I sometimes think to myself, is he playing rugby because he wants to, me, to make me proud and because he thinks he wants me to... Because sometimes he's not enjoying... I can see he doesn't enjoy it sometimes. He plays. And I can see the, I can see he's on the field sometimes. I'm thinking... He's not enjoying this. Is he playing because he wants to make me proud or is he playing because he wants to? So I think I've hopefully I've helped him now saying to him, 
I don't care. Don't play rugby. Don't. I don't care for rugby. Which I, if somebody said that to me twenty odd years ago, I love you. I'm proud of you. I don't care if you play rugby or not. Maybe I'm not knocking my family at all. That I love them the bits. They're amazing, amazing people. But I'm thinking maybe if I had that said to me years ago, it might have helped me. Maybe not feel so as a failure. I'm talking about the pressure. I'm hoping I'm taking the pressure off my son a bit, in a way. How amazing is that? 22 years old. To have that conversation with who you look up to as a role model, but you don't ever have those conversations with your parents. You ask, you know, how's your day? And it's all very small to me. You don't ever give the inner stuff, the real stuff. And for you no. to have done that and to do that for four hours and give him that time and that respect, I take my hat off to you. I mean, I'm in bits at the moment trying to compose myself as you're telling that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've gone through the 21-year-old Andrew, the 45-year-old yeah. Andrew. Talk to me about the future, Andrew. What's next for you? Because you've got all these life lessons. You've started discovering the real you. You've started getting the message out to those around you who you've always cared about their opinions. Now you know that you can be at peace with all that. How do you now move forward with your life for the third chapter and go, look, it's everything's okay. I've got a role to do in the world now, and this would see me to my nointers. So I still work in progress. Like everybody, everybody should work on their mental health. People have a personal trainer for their physical health, so but you need to work on your mental health as well because they go hand in hand. It's obviously scientifically proven now that they, they go hand in hand. Like there's a lot of work done around friendly bacteria, the gut microbiome, and things, and obviously that has a direct impact on your mental health as well. So, you know, I think they go hand in hand with mental and physical health. So obviously I look after myself still as well. I'm still learning and developing and reading and studying. I find it fascinating to find out. I recently qualified as an NLP practitioner as well as study of human behavior. So I found that like fascinating to do that as well, to find out why people behave the way they do. Because I personally believe this is, I, everybody's brought in this world exactly the same. Whether, you know, black, white, every man, woman, they're all brought in the world the same. And then through different traumas and experiences and environments in life, they, that's how they, they, you know, nobody's brought into the world a racist, nobody's brought into the world a certain way. So I've always tried to, I've always tried to accept people and understand people. I've always been like that. But I've always tried to, you know, I never try to judge anyone. I've always tried to treat everybody exactly the same until somebody upsets me or hurts me or I'll always treat them the same. I don't care, you know, I don't care where they're from, they're, you know, the color of their skin, they don't care, you know, they're, they're, anything, it doesn't bother me. And then, but obviously doing the NLP has made me realize why people act a certain way they do. And I find it fascinating. And I think, yeah, so what I want to do now is help inspire people and help people. I, I truly believe this might be a bold statement. I can change, change people's lives. I believe my, I, thousands of people out there. I want to really, I'm so passionate, as you were telling my voice, I think. I really want to make a difference in people's lives. And I, I, I hope for the platform, going on the traitors, I don't want to be a celebrity. I'm a, a down-to-earth guy from the valleys in Wales. I don't want to be a celebrity. I don't want to be famous. I didn't do it for that. I did it to try and raise awareness and break the stigma surrounding mental health. And, so, and the reaction I've had so far has been, it's been blown me away to be honest. I mean, it's been amazing and uh, it's been not overwhelming, but it's been very humbling. And this is that's the exact reaction I wanted. I got emotional on telly, for example, millions of people watching. I didn't care. I didn't care. I, did, I want people to see that a big, strong guy like me, a big, strong guy, I look after myself. I work securing the doors. And like, a lot of my friends, doormen, rugby people, gym people, they're probably the worst category of men for talking about things. But back last year, I put a video on Facebook. It had over 25,000 views. And I had so many messages of people, you know, of people, people I looked up to as a child, older than me, doormen, hard men, I thought, were, you know, big, strong men, messaged me saying, your video is an amazing, inspirational. I've now, I've now started talking to my kids, my parents. As a result of your video, you can do it. Yeah, I can do it. If I can do it, from my family, like a strong, well-known family where I live with, like, big, strong guys. I mean, and, and I get, when I put the video out there, I had people saying to me, God, I never knew you like that. You're always happy, life and soul. I said, well, what do you expect? I'm not going to walk on the streets crying with like a thunderbolt and you know, black cloud over my head. I said, it doesn't work like that. I said, you see, that's a mask I wore for 20 odd years. I said, but behind closed doors, you didn't see me lying in bed, crying my eyes out. You know, wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. And like I touched on it just now, my son, when I say he saved my life, I was 21 when I had my accident. My son was born when I was 23. So it was a very stressful time. And my son, it was a very difficult time for me, my partner, and my son. But looking back now, I, I got myself out of bed. I dragged myself out of bed in the morning. I wanted to be a role model for my son. So he was he was a good, he was an amazing kid. And like when I say saved my life, he was a, he, I had my purpose in life again. I wanted to do things. I wanted to get out of bed in the morning, take him to places and set a good example for my son. So that when I say that, that's why I meant when he saved my life. He didn't physically save my life. But he, he dragged me out of bed in the mornings and helped me massively. And I don't think he knows that. I don't think I ever told him to this day how, how much he's helped me in my life. Well, Andrew, I can't thank you enough. You've inspired me. You're going to inspire so many people. Keep that journey going, my friend. Keep doing and spreading these messages because 
there's no one else like you out there doing it and you've got Thank that well there's a reason why you were on the traitors there's a reason why you were saved in that car crash and there's a reason why a45 you've been given this third chapter of your life my thanks Thank to you. andrew jenkins and if you love the traitors it's obviously all on the iplayer for the current season season two they're putting the australian the new zealand the american version all on the iplayer go and watch them i can't wait i absolutely love all the versions around the world especially the australian and american ones they get very dirty and if you love <laughs> the traitors like i do amanda lover and kieran thompson from season one of the uk version has been on Sakinian Secure in the past. Go and check them out on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. I and mean, if you love Sakinian Secure, then thank you so much for watching or listening on social media at Johnny C for 92, on TikTok, on Instagram at Johnny C for at Sakinian Secure Podcast. I put previous teasers on. And then wherever you're watching on YouTube or wherever you're listening, click that subscribe button, click the notification button, and leave a five star rating and review and tell Andrew how much you love him. And let's keep spreading the word. It's okay to not be okay. I'm Johnny C for Thanks so much for watching or listening. Until next time, thank you and goodbye.